I'm going to keep tooting our constitutional horn here and we're going to talk about freedom of speech. One of the key motivations behind the founding of our country was the colonists' desire to break free from monarchical rule and establish a democratic society of self-governance. Uh, this dichotomy was so central to this that they took the core belief that separates these two forms of government and they enshrined it in the uh, First Amendment of the Constitution. That is the right to free speech. Today, in a society of increasing po political polarization and the advent of social media, this is becoming an increasingly controversial right. According to a 2024 poll conducted by the Foundation for Individual Rights and, and Expression, um, the right to free about one third of Americans uh, believe that the First Amendment goes, quote, too far, unquote. Uh, today, I'm going to argue that this right is just as important today as it was at the founding of this country, and um, because of three key ways that it enhances democracy. It enables uh, political pluralism, it encourages nuanced discourse, and it um, fosters an environment of authentic self-expression. Let's begin with a quick discussion of defining our terms. What do people actually mean when they talk about free speech? One common conception that I'd like to address is um, a lot of times people, especially in the modern day, you see people get censored on social media or they get their content taken down and they believe that this is a violation of their First Amendment rights. Um, but it's important to remember that the Constitution is a document that enshrines the rights and responsibilities of the government. Uh, not necessarily, doesn't apply to private entities in the same way. Um, so Twitter is within their right to remove content that they do not agree with for any reason, as long as it's not because the government can tell them to. Um, the other thing that is kind of a misconception is people believe when you talk about freedom of speech, it means the right to say whatever you want, whenever you want. And that's not true either. Um, according to a 2023 contribution to the U.S. Courts website, uh, they list several common exceptions, such as libel, which is knowingly spreading false information about someone to harm their reputation. Um, uh, what they call fighting words, which means using provocative language to evoke violence. Or... Um, uh, emergency calls to action, which the classic example would be like yelling fire in a crowded theater. These, among others, are all forms of speech that are not protected by the First Amendment. So even here in America, we do have to place reasonable restrictions on free speech. So let's talk about the ways that it enhances democracy, starting with political pluralism. Pluralism just means that we allow dissenting opinions to coexist. Um, a lot of critics of democracy will actually point to this as a weakness of democracy and say that it slows down our decision-making process and it encourages division. And I think that's fair criticism, but we have to remember that there is a trade-off that comes with this. We sacrifice some of our efficiency in order to have small-time individuals like you and I have a chance to have a voice in the conversation. Um, with a monarchical society or a authoritarian society, um, there is a lot less opportunity for individual citizens like you and I to contest, to protest the actions of, of the government if we don't agree. Can I see a quick show of hands if you believe that your government always does the right thing? Yeah, me neither. So under a uh, democratic society where we have the right to free speech, we are free to criticize those actions without fear of persecution from our government. According to Amnesty International, which is a human rights organization, um, a lot of societies that don't have free speech use this as a political weapon to persecute op opposition and shut down criticism. Now, next, let's talk about how it enhances nuanced dialogue. And for this, I'd like to point to one of my favorite quotes from John Stuart Mill, a political philosopher. He says, he who knows only his own side of the argument knows little of that. His reasons may be good, and no one may have been able to refute them. But if he is equally unable to refute the reasons on the opposite side, if he does not so much as know what they are, then he has no grounds for preferring either opinion. I think this quote does an excellent job of highlighting the importance of seeing both sides. Um, it allows us to uh, see the arguments for what they actually are, especially in the age of uh, social media. A lot of times our discourse gets centered in echo chambers where we may never actually confront the actual argument um, by go uh, partaking in the process of free speech and forcing ourselves to be exposed to these perspectives, we are forced to engage with the actual points, maybe find points of common ground or kernels and truth on the other side that can lead to a third possibility of compromise. Um, even if we're not persuaded by their arguments, it gives us a chance to humanize our opponents by understanding their justifications and their reasons for why they believe what they believe. Um, and even still, it has benefits for our own beliefs. Even if we aren't convinced by them, um, we get a chance to really try them against uh, opposition and 
to really understand our own justifications so that we can better articulate them moving forward. So we talked a lot about kind of the societal level implications, but let's talk more on the individual level. Freedom of speech fosters an environment of authentic self-expression. Um, in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, Professor Ian Carter talks about uh, the distinction between a negative right and a positive right. Uh, a positive right is something that can only be given to you, whereas a negative right is something that can only be taken away. And freedom of speech is intrinsically linked with our freedom of thought. And that is, in my opinion, a positive right that or sorry, a negative right that can only be taken from us, not given to us. Um, if people are not allowed to express their true opinions and say what they think, it can lead to build up a resentment and um, isolation from society that pushes people to the fringes where they are prey, easy prey for extremist ideologies to welcome them with open arms. Um, so in my poll data, it seemed like most of the respondents kind of agreed with the general point that free speech is a good thing. But where there's a little bit more disagreement was should we allow extremist speech or offensive speech to have a seat at the conversation? And I will be a little controversial and say yes, we should. Um, so as, as I mentioned, if we push them underground and censor them and, and uh, don't allow them to speak out, then that discourse will take place underground below our noses. We may not have a good idea of when these sentiments build up in our society and it kind of but, and with the theme of authenticity, it allows them a chance to show their true colors so that uh, the First Amendment protects you from government persecution, but it doesn't protect you from the consequences of your speech. And so us as the public can exercise our responsibility to address these arguments. Um, yeah, and also the, uh, the, we can present their arguments alongside counter arguments rather than them giving a one-sided explanation to vulnerable individuals. A really good counter argument to this is known as the paradox of tolerance. It was articulated by American philosopher Karl Popper. He uh, basically says, if we extend unlimited tolerance even to those who are intolerant, if we are not prepared to defend a tolerant society against the onslaught of the intolerant, then the tolerant will be destroyed. Basically what he's saying here is if we allow intolerant voices to get too loud, they can get to a point where they uh, overrule the, the public opinion and put, essentially get away with, or do away with free speech altogether. A lot of people use this as an argument against allowing extremists to uh, speak freely, but they forget the next part of this quote, which is, in this formulation, I do not imply, for instance, that we should always suppress the utterance of intolerant philosophies, as long as we can counter them by rational argument and keep them in check by public opinion. Suppression would certainly be most unwise. Here, Popper warns us not to engage in the same kind of authoritarian censorship that we criticize these ideologies for. So I just want to end with some closing thoughts about what this means for us going forward. Our generation is going to have to navigate unprecedented challenges, whether we like it or not. With the onset of climate change, increased political division, the crisis of meaning, and the advent of AI, we must preserve our right to free speech so that we can address these complex issues from a multifaceted perspective. The ability to speak our minds freely should not be taken for granted because this is what separates our democratic society from a monarchical one. The right to free speech enhances democratic society by uh, encouraging democratic pluralism, um, allowing for nuanced uh, dialogue, and uh, fostering authentic self-expression. Thank you.